Uh, welcome. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 17th Roy R. and Virginia F. Ray Lecture at the University of Kentucky College of Law. I am David Brennan, Dean and Professor at the Law School. In a moment, I will introduce to you our featured speaker, but first, to give greetings on behalf of the University of Kentucky, I would like to present to you our president, Dr. Eli Capilouto. Dr. Ca no, 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 I, I have to say this, I have to say this. Yes, I do. <laughs> Dr. Capilouto became the 12th president of the University of Kentucky on July 1 of 2011. He's a native of Montgomery, Alabama, and previously served as provost at University of Alabama, Birmingham, and dean of the University of Alabama, Birmingham School of Public Health. Since joining UK as president just over two years ago, Dr. Capilouto has engaged in a remarkable campus building effort. Over the span of two years, and he doesn't want me to say this, but I'm going to say it any, anyway. He has developed a plan to replace nearly every dorm on campus, significantly improve Commonwealth football stadium, and refurbish and expand, expand many academic buildings, including, hopefully very soon, our beloved... <laughs> our beloved yet outdated College of Law building. <laughs> Dr. Capilouto has embarked on this impressive building effort at a state university by relying significantly on private revenue sources. In addition to his capital building activities, however, Dr. Capilouto has been very focused on improving the educational experience at the University of Kentucky. For example, this year under his leadership, the university is welcoming the largest and one of the most academically distinguished first year classes in its history. We have a record 4,702 first year students joining our largest student body ever of over 29,000 students. We have 105 National Merit Scholars up from 71 last year when UK ranked in the top 15 among public universities in the country. We have 555 African American and 200 Hispanic students, both the largest in our institution's history and the co continuation of consistent growth since 2008. Importantly, <laughs> importantly, the university this year has seen an increase of more than one percentage point in our first to second year retention rates and significant percentage point increases in third to fourth year retention rates. Thus, Dr. Capilouto is not only committed to improving our infrastructure and growing our enrollment, but he is also committed to providing the best possible educational experience for our students. Without further ado, I present to you Dr. Eli Capilouto to extend words of welcome. That's too much, but I couldn't resist it. I couldn't resist. <laughs> David, thank you for the kind introduction. And I want you to spend a lot of time with Justice Kagan because I, I read that her fundraising efforts for the Harvard College of Law was $449 million. Is that right? <laughs> you stay close to her. <laughs> so on behalf of the University of Kentucky, it is my pleasure to welcome you, as David has, to tonight's Roy and Virginia Ray Lecture. For more than a century, the University of Kentucky College of Law has prepared many of our Commonwealth and nation's prominent public servants, each committed to upholding the doctrine and ethics of their profession, each exploring the centrality of law and serving the public's best interest. I'm continually moved by the work of our alumni and the programs supported by the College of Law. Among them, and because of the generous support of the Ray family, is this lecture series. It's a hallmark on our campus. For the last 30 years, it has brought many of the foremost legal scholars and leaders to our campus to discuss the legal, legal topics of the day. Among our guests have been Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, Justice Albie Sachs of the South African Constitutional Court, Yale Law School Dean Robert Post, and the Honorable Abner Mikva. This evening, we add another name. It is a most sincere honor to welcome tonight's distinguished guest, Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan. I do so as a relatively new citizen of the Commonwealth, having been here just over two years. 
Justice Kagan, this state, though small in population, has given much to this country in the way of public servants and excellent service. Everyone certainly recognizes the name of an eminent national statesman, former senator, speaker of the House, and secretary of state, Henry Clay. But this state has also been the home to four vice presidents, Richard M. Johnson, John C. Breckinridge, Adlai E. Stevenson I, and Alvin W. Barkley. Now I have a question for this distinguished audience. How many Supreme Court justices have been born or appointed from the state of Kentucky? <laughs> 10. Oh. Okay. Starting in 1807 with Justice Thomas Todd, he was followed by Robert Trimble, Samuel Miller, John Harlan, Horace Lurton, James McReynolds, Louis Brandeis, Stanley Reed, Wiley Rutledge, and Chief Justice Frederick M. Vinson. For two of these justices, the University of Kentucky maintains an impressive oral history and collection of papers. Chief Justice Stanley Reed, who by the way, I learned today, was the sole witness for the defense in the Alger Hiss case, and Chief Justice Frederick Vinson. The collection includes opinions and correspondence on the issues of desegregation leading up to and around the landmark 1954 decision, Brown versus the Board of Education. The collection is made up of 43 interviews with clerks, colleagues, and families, including one interview with Justice Reed, you get used to this honesty in Kentucky, who said of President Truman's appointment of Chief Justice Vinson, I wondered why he didn't pick me. <laughs> The Commonwealth represents a proud people, deep in values that show up in unexpected ways and in unexpected places. For example, Vico, Kentucky, smallest town in America to approve a fairness ordinance on the basis <laughs> on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. Mayor Johnny Cummings, whose office I dropped in on this week while I was in Eastern Kentucky, leads a small Appalachian mining hamlet of 330 people in Eastern Kentucky. In the final minutes of the now growing more famous each day segment from the Colbert Report, <laughs> a Vico citizen said, and I love this, if God makes him born gay, then why is he against it? Simple, simple and profound wisdom that endears this state to me and many others. In the words of one of our artistic luminaries and former poet laureate, Jesse Stewart, Kentucky is neither northern, excuse me, southern, northern, eastern, or western. It is the core of America. If these United States could be called a body, Kentucky can be called its heart. Justice Kagan, we hope that during your short time with us, you can begin to see, hear, and feel our soul and heart. Thank you for being here. Well, welcome. Thank you, Dean Brennan. Is my mic working? I guess it is. No one's giving me a funny look. Okay. Um, Thank you, President Capilouto, too. I would like to start by saying a few words about Justice Kagan, and then we'll get into the conversation. Elena Kagan is Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Justice Kagan is the court's 112th justice and only the fourth female justice in its history. She is currently one of only three women in, on the nine-person court. Justice Kagan attended Hunter College High School in New York and I am told that there is a photo of her in her high school yearbook at age 16 in which she is dressed in a judge's robe and holding a gavel. <laughs> Despite this photo, I've heard that Justice Kagan insists that she did not at that time have intentions on becoming a judge. <laughs> After high school, Justice Kagan attended Princeton and Oxford and graduated from the Harvard Law School in 1986. She then was at, she was at Harvard at the same time as one of our UK law professors, Professor Roberta Harding, who's here with us today. Upon graduation from law school, she clerked for Judge Abner Mikva 
on the D.C. Circuit, and then for Justice Thurgood Marshall of the United States Supreme Court. Justice Kagan is a former law professor, having taught at the University of Chicago Law School, where she won a Best Teacher Award. She's also served as Associate White House Counsel and Deputy Assistant Director of Domestic Policy under President Bill Clinton. Shortly thereafter, she was nominated to the D.C. Circuit, but her nomination expired without final Senate action, and we will get to that during the conversation. But failing to be confirmed for the D.C. Circuit did not slow her down. She took on the role of Dean of Harvard Law School, the first woman to hold that position in its history. While she served as Dean, another UK law professor, Jennifer Bird Poland, was a student at Harvard Law School who often saw her on campus. After six years serving as Dean of Harvard Law School, President Barack Obama appointed Justice Kagan to be the first female Solicitor General of the United States. A short while later, President Obama nominated Justice Kagan to fill Justice John Paul Stevens' seat on the Supreme Court of the United States. The United States Senate confirmed her appointment effective in 2010. Since joining the court just over three years ago, Justice Kagan has seen a myriad of matters come before her at the court, each bringing new challenges. And while Solicitor General, she argued on behalf of the United States in one of the most important cases of this decade, Citizens United. As a justice, she has heard cases involving gay marriage, the Affordable Care Act, and many, in my personal favorite, a case involving taxpayer standing in which Justice Kagan wrote her first ever dissenting opinion. I'm a tax lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> During our conversation tonight with Justice Kagan, I do not intend to ask her about pending court matters, nor do I intend to explore her reasons for deciding past cases or choosing not to decide certain cases. Instead, our conversation will focus on her life as a judge. How does she manage her clerks? How does she get along with the other judges? What is it like to be a judge on the US Supreme Court without having actually served as a judge before being appointed? You get the picture. After about 30 or 40 minutes, I will then ask the president of our College of Law Student Bar Association, Mr. Thomas Riker, to pre present a few questions that are most on the minds of our UK law students. So let's get started. First, let's talk about that photo. <laughs> so you really did it's a not. A little bit embarrassing. <laughs> you really didn't think you would be a judge at that no, time. No, I didn't think I was going to be a lawyer at that time. My father was a lawyer, mm. and uh, I have to say that what he did never struck me as all that exciting. Mm. <laughs> and uh, and so I, I, now it does, you know, but then it didn't. So I was looking for something else. Uh, okay. But I went to law school for all the reasons that everybody says not to go to law school. Okay which was, uh, I don't really know what else to do when it keeps my options open, you know? Yeah, yeah. And later when I became dean, I would tell constant, I would tell many, many students, I would tell them all the time, don't go to law school if the only reason you're coming here is because you don't know what else to do and you want to keep your options open. And I would say that and then I would think, but that's why I went to law school, you know? <laughs> um, uh, but so I, I honestly didn't, uh, didn't really expect to go to law school, and, but, but when I got there, I, I loved it, okay. and I thought, you know, this is this. I I'm, I might have landed here for the wrong reasons, yeah. but this is the place for me. Well, good, great. What was your favorite course in law school? Uh, you know, I had great teachers my first year, but uh, I'm I'm going to say something odd. My favorite course was civil procedure, which is you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know, for whatever reason, I just liked all the procedural rules. And uh, you know, I liked civil procedure. I liked administrative procedure later on in uh, in law school. So you know, I, I liked a lot of different courses for a lot of different reasons. But but uh, I, I was kind of a proceduralist at heart, like ah. a, a rules kind of person. Now you were once described when being promoted from White House Counsel to Deputy Domestic Policy Advisor as, and I quote here, the all-purpose brain, and I quote again, advisor to the president on legal and policy matters. So what was it like giving constitutional advice to the president, and how did you develop this type of expertise? Uh, well, it was, it was great to work at the White House. It's an amazing place to work. Maybe, you know, it's the most uh, hectic and harried and pressured place I've ever worked, including the job I have now. Um, but tremendously exciting. I mean, uh, every day is 50 new things and 50 new issues, and uh, everything is done really fast and on the fly. And you can't really uh, be an expert 
in, mm -hmm. in everything you have to deal with. I mean, that's true in a lot of jobs, but, but es es especially there, it was just everything was done at such a, a fast pace, and you just had to get used to that. But um, you know, it was a tremendous, tremendous honor uh, working there, and I worked first as a lawyer, and then I worked as a policy person and very different kind of roles and different perspectives, but, but I enjoyed both. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, I always had the sense with President Clinton, I'm, I'm an unabashed admirer of, of, uh, of, of his and, and, you know, what was then. That's why I went to work for him. And uh, no matter how much you knew about an issue, whether law or policy, chances were that he knew more about it. <laughs> so I used to sometimes think, you know, to be like the, you know, to give uh, education policy advice to him, it was a joke because <laughs> you would just start a conversation and then, and then he would know a thousand times more than you did. But, um, uh, but we pretended to give him advice and, <laughs> and he occasionally pretended to take it. <laughs> and, uh, no, it was, it was great. Well, you, we, we mentioned your, your work in public service. You also spent some time in the private sector. Uh, what are the pluses and minuses of being in the private sector versus the public sector with the, using your law degree? Well, I have to say one of the great things about, about my career is that I've done a lot of different things, or at least I think that's great. Some people would say it sort of just shows a short attention span. <laughs> but but I've, I've, I've worked in private practice, and I've, I've worked in government, and I've, I've taught, of course, and I've liked every part of that, and I've enjoyed the, you know, when people say law schools, it keeps your options open, and one of the things it does is it allows people, if they want to, some people don't want to, but if they want to, to kind of go back and forth to different places to you know create a career where you're in private life but then you're in public service and then you go back to uh, the private sector and uh, you know I enjoyed that I enjoyed seeing a lot of different work environments and and uh, approaching law from a lot of different perspectives wearing different kind of hats if you will mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I think I learned something in all of those different places okay okay um, tell me this about law school uh, what do you think about legal education today? And let me give you a, an example. Um, President Obama recently announced that he thought law school should be two years instead of three years. Do you have any thoughts on that, being a former law school dean? You know, I, I, th I think I'm, I'm, I'm not going to join the two-year versus three-year debate. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I'm honestly not so sure that the, 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 the president, maybe, uh, well, I won't say <laughs> I feel so. I personally do not know enough about the current, but, but um, I mean, I think it's good to debate these issues. Law schools are obviously in a stressful period right now. I think uh, a lot of law schools have uh, seen, have, uh, uh, you know, they're not getting the applicants that they once used to. They're yes. cutting class size. I think it's probably right that there are too many law schools turning out too many student, law students right now, that they're really, that they're too many law students coming out without uh, uh, great opportunities and carrying very high debt burdens, and that that's a real problem that mm -hmm. law schools have to think about. Uh, okay. And different law schools experience that in very, very different ways. And I, you know, I suspect, actually, that um, as law schools sort of think about what their mission is and, and how they can best prepare their students and how they can ensure that their students are coming out with with the opportunities that will allow them to pay off these debts and so forth, uh, that they're going to reach different answers and that they should because they're just all, you know, a lot of different kinds of law schools serving a lot of different kinds of communities in yes. this country. Yes. And, and, and do you have any thoughts about the, the move towards increasing skills training for, for law students? Well, I think it's really important. Uh, uh, you know, the days when all you did was learn sort of abstract legal principles in classrooms uh, I think are, are over in pretty much every law school, that mm -hmm. it's important to give people a sense of what it's like to actually practice law, and that the best way to do that is to give them some experience practicing law. So, you know, I, mean, I think most of these, these two-year proposals, it's a sort of two-year and then your third year, it's essentially to serve an apprenticeship. Right. And in some ways, that's not so different from what a lot of uh, law schools are trying to do which is to give students greater clinical opportunities, especially in their third year. Okay, okay. Now, you became Solicitor General when you were, when you were 
received that position, you had never argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. Explain, Thanks for mentioning that, Dean <laughs> Explain how you did the job if you had never been there. Yeah. Just for the audience, you can talk about what Solicitor General is and, and then go from there. Yeah, so the Solicitor General is the person who represents the United States in the Supreme Court and generally supervises all the appellate litigation of the United States, chooses which appeals to take, chooses which cases to then petition the Supreme Court to take, um, uh, is in charge of all the briefing that's done in the Supreme Court, is in charge, uh, and is in charge of assigning lawyers to uh, argue those cases in the court and to argue the most important of those cases, him or herself. Um, and you're quite right, uh, uh, D Dean, that when uh, that I had never done an appellate argument before, and in fact, when the Obama administration folks, they had uh, contacted me at the beginning after the president was elected and said, "Would you, would you like to go into government again?" I said, "You know, I would be interested in hearing about what they were thinking," and I thought that they were looking at me for a couple of other jobs, quite honestly. And then they came back to me and they said, "We'd like you to be Solicitor General." And I really said, you know, you have the wrong person, you know, uh, uh, it's not, that's not, and, and they said, no, you know, uh, you know, here's why we think that mm -hmm. you're good to do this job and we're not, why we're not worried. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, if they're not worried, I guess I won't be worried either. <laughs> uh, uh, no, in fact, I was a little bit worried, uh, but the Solicitor General's office is an incredible, incredible office full of people who have enormous amounts of experience and who are really generous in imparting their expertise and their learning and their experience. And, and when I got to the office, you know, I knew that I didn't know some stuff and, and, uh, and I made sure to, uh, to, you know, ask a lot of people a lot of questions and to try to figure out how, how to learn what I needed to know. And, uh, you know, I hope I, I did okay in the job. I, you know, I, I, I think I kind of did, but yeah. that's, for, that's for other people to say, of course. I did lose that one case that you mentioned, yes. you know. Do you want to talk we, about we that case a little about, bit? We can talk sure. about that case. It was, so uh, that was Citizens my first, United. That was my first case. It was the, the re-argument of a very important case involving campaign finance. And uh, uh, it had been argued uh, a couple of days after I became Solicitor General by a deputy of mine, and everybody thought that the argument had gone, you know, pretty, really pretty badly, and everybody was expecting to lose. And then the last day of term, uh, uh, the court uh, announced that it was going to re-argue the case, but that was not good news, because essentially what the court did was to say, it used to be a small case, <laughs> Uh, now we're going to decide whether to overturn a couple of precedents in a way that would make it a much bigger and much more important case, but also very much in, uh, signaled that the court was ready to take that step and uh, uh, that, the, uh, that the piece of legislation that the Solicitor General was uh, defending, which was the big McCain-Feingold campaign finance legislation, that, uh, that the court was going to find it unconstitutional. So, uh, so the next fall, uh, I did the re-argument, and of course, you know, it was, it was nervous making. It was my first argument, and it was in a big case, which had a lot of, uh, you know, it was high profile. Everybody was kind of watching. But the one good thing about it was that there was not a person in Washington who thought that I could win this case. <laughs> <laughs> so in some ways, the pressure was off. You know, nobody was saying, oh, your argument is very important, right? In fact, everybody was saying, well, you know, uh, hope you have a good time up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the truth of the matter was I did have a good time up there. Is, uh, you know, I got up to the podium, and my heart was pounding fast. And and then I, I started speaking and words came out and the words seemed to me to, you know, be formed in, forming into sentences. And I thought, okay, I can do this. And, and then it's, it's very fast. You don't really have time to be nervous after that okay. because the justices are throwing questions at you so quickly and you're just having to answer them and do the best you can at them. And it's really quite a lot of fun to be up there at the podium arguing to the Supreme Court. It's kind of, you know, it gives you a rush. And, uh, and, and, and if you can just think of it, which I think the best lawyers do as, as you know, here's my opportunity to have a conversation with nine justices of the Supreme right. Court. That's kind of a great experience. 
Yeah, I, I, I kind of like that whole idea of, of life gives you lemons and you make lemonade. So uh, tell me. So the lemon was the Solicitor General's <laughs> office? I don't know. Was well, the I, Citizens I, United I, case. I, I, I see. I got it. So tell, tell me about, uh, I, 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 I won't say what the situation is, but I'll just ask the question and you can kind of present it. Um, have there been other challenges in your life that you've overcome um, uh, in, in, in your kind of uh, academic life uh, that, that turned out to be a, a good thing, a good experience? I'm, you know, I just answered the same question to this whole class of students, and, and, they, and they asked, uh, the, the, the student asked it in much the same way uh -huh. that you did. He, he actually picked out, again, I don't know, it, he's, uh, this, this thing about my, the picture of me in a judge's robe must be like all over the internet or something. <laughs> because he said, oh, I hear you wanted to be a judge from an early age, and it just yeah. seemed like everything just, uh, you know, fell like dominoes until yeah. you reached that point, and wasn't uh -huh. at all easy. It seems very easy. Right. And you know, nobody, I, I don't think, at least not me, but mm -hmm. I think for everybody, there are, uh, 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 you know, uh, times when there's, you think there's no way I'm going to achieve my goals, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and times when you don't achieve your goals. And, you know, what I said to the student, was uh, when I got to law school, uh, my first year of law school, my first semester uh, particularly, I did quite badly. And uh, you know, I got my first set of grades back and I was in the bottom third of my law school class. And I thought, well, you know, so much for any ambitions that I had, right? <laughs> and you know, then it turns out life does not end with your first semester law school grades, right? <laughs> But if, you know, if I were to list for you the jobs that I wanted during my life that I didn't get, it would really be very boring because it's a quite long list, actually. And uh, the Chief Justice and I have talked about this because the Chief Justice and I had one particular job that we both didn't get. He eventually got it, but we were both, as, as, as you uh, indicated earlier, we were both nominated to the D.C. Circuit, mm -hmm. which is considered a very important uh, appellate court in this country. And uh, and my nomination lapsed without the Senate acting on it, and so did his. Uh, eventually, like 10 or 15 years later, he got on onto that court. But uh, I think, uh, you know, for me at least, and I suspect he would say the same thing, it turned out that uh, you know, I was nominated to the court when I was 39. I would have been very young. I would have, you know, served the rest of my life as a judge. Uh, in fact, when I look back and think what I did with that in that decade and the things I learned, and the skills I developed and the experiences I had, I am really super glad that the Senate didn't confirm me way back then and that I had the opportunity to do a lot of new and different and other things before I finally became a judge. And I think that that's often the way life works, that you, know, okay. you think you want something, you don't get it, and then it turns out it was kind of a good thing that you yep. didn't get it because when a door closed one place, a window opened yeah. someplace else, and and, uh, and it ended up being, you know, just fine. Very good answer. Okay. Like that. Okay. <laughs> now, the others have not been? <laughs> <laughs> I won't comment. <laughs> Let's compare the experience of being an advocate before the court um, as Solicitor General and being a justice. Did you have any concerns of when you were an advocate on behalf of the United States that you would be defending a position that you just didn't agree with? You know, I just think that that goes along with the role. Uh, I, I mean, I think you just have to put on, it's, it's, not, it's not you, you have a client. The client is, uh, in the Solicitor General's office, we think of the client as the long-term interests of the United States. <laughs> uh, and sometimes we have to figure out what exactly the long-term interests of the United States are. But it's, it's very clear that they're, they're, they're not necessarily uh, 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 coincident with your own personal interests, right. you know? And you know, that's being a lawyer, is that you have to sort of put your own interests and your own views to one side and ad adopt the morality, of, if you will, of the institution and, uh, and, uh, and adopt and, uh, the, 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 and, and argue, to the extent uh, possible, the, the interests of your client. And, and so, you know, I'm sure that there were conflicts, but I never really experienced it as a conflict because 
because I always knew, you know, what my job was, and it wasn't to argue what Elena Kagan thought up there. Mm -hmm. It was to argue uh, what the Solicitor General's office thought was in the best interests of the of the um, U.S. government. Now, do you think that sa same analysis applies to our students who want to represent criminal defendants who do things that they don't agree with? Yeah, I think a very similar analysis applies. I think in a lot of legal roles. I mean, it's not what it's uh, it's it's not about you. It's about your client. <laughs> And uh, the morality of a lawyer is to sort of understand the difference between those two things. Okay. Um, now, when you're on the court, there are oftentimes uh, disagreements uh, amongst the different justices. Um, Never. <laughs> how do you resolve disagreements when you are a justice versus when you are a solicitor general. As a solicitor general, you have to kind of argue and, and make sure the justice is kind of buy your argument. As a justice, how do you persuade the other justices to buy your argument? Right. Well, it's it's hard in both roles, you know. And uh, it's you know it's somewhat similar. Uh, yes. Uh, sometimes I, I I think that my job as solicitor general was to try to persuade nine justices to my view, and my job as a Supreme Court justice is just to try to persuade eight justices to my <laughs> view. So there's there's a there's a lot in common there. Um, uh, but uh, you know, uh, you uh, you use your persuasive powers as best you can, and uh, we we all do that in argument, uh, during argument. Part of argument is asking lawyers questions, but part of it is a little bit talking to each other and trying to persuade each other. Then we go into conference and we do the same thing. And, uh, and then often we'll exchange memos about a case, uh, maybe before an opinion circulates, maybe afterwards. Um, and uh, you know, so you try, but, uh, but, but look, these are nine people with, who are, who are confident and secure and really smart mm -hmm. and uh, have views of their own. And you know, you know, sometimes you might be able to and, and uh, often uh, you won't and there will be disagreement. Um, so you know, I think actually the court agrees more often than people give it credit for. Uh, uh, last year I think we acted unanimously on about half of our cases. But there are obviously some important set of cases where, uh, where we divide, where we disagree, where we, if you read our, our uh, opinions, we disagree sharply. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, on those, you, you uh, I think, I think the, the, I think what we're pretty good at, actually, is we, we disagree and then we put it aside and we come back the next day and uh, approach things fresh and, uh, uh, you know, hope to agree the next time. Okay. Now, you had never been a judge before being appointed to the Supreme Court, and you're the first justice in several decades, but you were a Solicitor General. Did being Solicitor General serve you well as kind of an appropriate substitute for being a judge? I honestly think it's at least as good and probably a better preparation for okay. being a Supreme Court justice than being an appellate judge is. Um, you know, the, in, 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 as, as Solicitor General, all I did was think about the court, about the court's docket, about the court's practices and procedures, about the people on the court, how they decided cases, um, the, 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 the various approaches and methodologies that they took. So I was really steeped in what the court was doing, not for a, a very long period of time, uh, but, but, but still, I thought that that was great preparation. And, you know, there were some things I didn't have. Uh, uh, my, uh, my colleagues who had been judges before, they had very established routines for how they did things, you know, how they used clerks, who drafted the opinions, when they prepared for argument, what kinds of questions they asked at argument, things like that, that I had to figure out for myself. And, okay. and, and certainly the first year was a lot of trial and error figuring those things out. But you know, by the end of the first year, I basically had had learned what worked for me and and uh, the, the the ways, uh, the best ways for me to uh, to learn about a case, to think about a case, to try to decide a case. And uh, uh, you know, otherwise, I thought that the preparation in the SG's office was was really awfully good. Okay, great. Um, now you were also a law school dean. How did that prepare you for being a Supreme Court justice? Well, it might be that some experiences in life just don't prepare you to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, and that might be one of them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I love being a Dean. I mean, do you love being a Dean? Oh, yes, I love it. Okay, yeah. I love being a Dean. Uh, I was saying this earlier today, too, to, to, to your faculty. I loved being a Dean because it allowed me to do a very, very wide range of things and to learn a lot of different skills. And, uh, and you know, I used to think of it as like exercising every muscle in my body. And, and that's actually not the kind of job I have now. You know, the kind of job I have now, I have to do one thing uh, well, and, or, one, or one set of things. Mm -hmm. But it's not a job where I sort of like bop around and I do this one day and I do that the next day and I do something completely different uh, the third day and that I have to be reasonably good at a whole range of things that have nothing to do with each other. Right. And I thought that that was the challenge of being a dean and yes. I, really, I really enjoyed that. But it's not, it's not honestly the job I have now. But I will tell you what I think did prepare me. Uh, I, was, um, I often think about, about uh, being a teacher. And the way I think about that is when I'm writing an opinion uh, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about how to convey uh, some complicated set of legal principles or, or, or you know, how, how, to, how to communicate why I'm deciding a complicated issue in a certain way. Uh, what I think about is how I would have taught it. Uh, you know, because when I used to prepare to teach, I mean, it's the same kind of thing. It's like this complicated body of law and there are a lot of people out there and they don't have a clue what it's all about. And, uh, and you want to convey it to them in a way that they understand uh, at the moment, and also in a way that kind of sticks with them, you know? So you have to figure out not just to say it clearly at the moment, but also how to give them ways, you know, how to convey it vividly enough so that it will stick in their heads, uh, you know, uh, that day and then a couple of months later when you took, take the final, and you hope a few years after that when you actually need the information. And I think about writing on the court in the same kind of way that I used to think about preparing to teach a class. It's like, how can I communicate something in a way that's clear, in a way that people will understand, but also in a way that will really speak to people and that people will remember and, and sort of identify with? Right, right, okay. Now, um, you, you mentioned your clerks in, in, in passing. How do you work with your clerks? What do you ask them to do and what value do they add to your role as justice? Uh, so I have four of them, and they're all, you know, very recent law school graduates, and, you know, they're great, they're smart, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're incredibly hardworking. And, um, uh, and I use them, uh, I, I, most importantly, I use them just to talk about the cases. Uh, so I'll, on every case, there will be one clerk assigned, and that clerk will write me a short bench memo, and the bench memo will basically just uh, be the clerk's take on the case, how the clerk would decide it if the right. clerk were a judge. And then I'll bring all four of them into my office and we'll sit around a table and, uh, and I'll say, well, what do the rest of you think? And I like to hear different perspectives, so I try to get clerks who will give me different perspectives. Okay. And I like to uh, talk through arguments and hear the way they sound when other people say them and uh, hear the way they sound when they come out of my mouth. and, and uh, and so, so that's a great benefit of clerks, is just, you know, uh, uh, the ability to talk with a set of people who have only your interests at heart uh, about, about the cases. Um, uh, I, I ask my clerks to draft opinions, but uh, to be frank, I don't use the drafts uh, much. Okay. I mean, I use them to think through the case, but then I start from scratch on a, a you know, new sheet of paper and I write my own opinion because th for me, that's the way I learn is to mm -hmm. actually write something. Uh, sort of, you know, one of these, I don't know what I think until I see what I say. Right. And, and, um, uh, and the, the, the way I really figure out a case and really sort of plumb its depths is only by writing it. But, um, but a, a, a draft will kind of give me some things to think about as I start that process and, and so that's helpful. And, uh, and then all of our clerks, maybe the most important thing that they do on the court, or the thing we really could not do without them, is, uh, is to help us select case, okay. cases. Because we get about 10,000 petitions every year, and we only hear about 80 cases. 
And the process of going from 10,000 petitions to 80 cases is one in which, uh, you know, we really couldn't do it without the clerks. The clerks read all the petitions and, and give us memos on the petitions so that we can focus on the most important ones and the ones that realistically stand a shot of, uh, of being taken for review. So each clerk roughly goes through 250 cases. Uh, how does that, it's 10,000 divided by about 36 clerks or something? Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> in his book, The Nine, Inside the Secret World of the Supreme Court by Jeffrey Tubin, he talks about the conference room that the justices utilize to discuss their cases and the opinions. Uh, would you describe to the extent that you can what it's like in the Supreme Court conference room when justices are discussing the cases? So it's a big room and there's a big table in the middle of it and um, I'm told that there's a little bit of controversy about exactly which way the table should go. <laughs> I'm serious about this. Justice Stevens re recently wrote a book uh -huh. And he starts talking about how the table was switched around and it was really bad that way, but <laughs> but I don't know, it's always been in one place for my short tenure, so it seems okay to me. Right. And but uh, we, have a, we have assigned seating, just like law schools, and uh, uh, basically the, the Chief Justice sits on one end of the table, the Senior Associate Justice, who is Justice Scalia, sits on the other end of the table, and then from Justice Scalia, it kind of goes around in seniority order. The, the Supreme Court is a pretty seniority-based uh, institution, and um, uh, uh, so to be the junior justice means to be subject to a little bit of hazing. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, and, and, and when we go in and we decide cases, um, the Chief Justice will start, and he'll kind of frame the issue. He'll say, you know, the case is about this and that, and, uh, and then he'll talk a little bit about the way he sees the case and give a tentative vote. And then it goes around in order. And there's a rule that uh, nobody can speak twice before everybody has spoken once, okay. which is a very good rule if you're the ninth person to speak, you know, because good rule for at least meetings, you're the ninth right? person, not the <laughs> 33rd or something. Um, uh, but then once we all speak, uh, then uh, not always, but often, more general conversation will, okay. uh, will, will break out and we'll go, but, you know, somebody will say, well, you said this, but I don't agree with that, or, you know, I want to follow up, I want to ask you a question about something that you said, and we'll, especially in cases where we're, we're having to work to, to, to get five judges on board uh, and a particular approach, or just in cases where people are, are fluid as to the way they think about the case, uh, you know, there will be a lot of free-form discussion and, and, uh, and, and very substantive, you know, really good quality discussion. Uh, you know, in other cases, and sometimes in important cases, and sometimes in the most important cases, it will be pretty clear that the, they're, uh, they're, everybody has their view and they're, the, nobody's particularly persuadable and that the only thing that further discussion is going to do is to get people annoyed at each other. And, uh, and in those cases, you know, we often will just, you know, each of us say our, says our piece, and then we leave it alone. Okay, okay. What, what's the value of oral argument? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, uh, and here's, uh, I, I think almost, I think all of us would say that oral argument is not nearly as important as the briefs. That, um, that the real time when you're thinking through a case when you're forming impressions of a case, and when you're doing most of the work to decide a case, is as you read the briefs and think about the briefs. Uh, and, and people very seldom go into oral argument uh, in complete equipoise, you know? I mean, by the time you get to oral argument, most people e either have a strong view one way or at least are leaning uh, one way. Um, uh, so at that point, you know, what, you, you know it's, it's rare that anybody either wins a case or loses a case at oral argument. It happens occasionally, so you can't say it never happens. Sometimes it does, but it's, it's not all that common. Uh, I, th I think at the court, at the Supreme Court, um, uh, oral argument has a function sort of beyond really trying to 
figure out a case and trying to get the information that you need to decide it. Some, sometimes that's what it's for, and sometimes people use it for that purpose. But it's also a place where the, the justices actually can converse with each other. So oral argument is the first time that we'll talk about a case with each other. We don't meet to talk about a case before oral argument. You know, we're going to meet afterwards. But uh, given that there are nine of us and that you know, people go around the table and sort of vote and they won't hear what a lot of folks have to say mm -hmm. until after they've voted, that oral argument actually becomes a place where you can hear what your colleagues are thinking about a case and where you can convey what you're thinking. I mean, I think about this often. As I said, I, I talk ninth in conference, mm -hmm. so everybody's already voted by the time it gets to me. And so to the extent that I have a, a different take on a case, maybe a view that, that is a little bit different from the positions that have been argued in the briefs, maybe you know, some sort of uh, compromise position or just a different take on a case, I'll often try to introduce that in oral arguments to give people an opportunity to think about it um, uh, before they go into the conference room. And, and my colleagues do the same thing, and one of, and, 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 you know, I try to listen really hard to my colleagues during our oral argument because, you know, that's where I figure out what everybody else is thinking about a case. Okay. Well, um, now, the, there are nine different justices. They presumably have nine completely different personalities. Is the court cohesive? I mean, do you all kind of go over to each other's houses for dinner after court, or what's, what's it like amongst the justices themselves, personally? Well, I think we like each other an enormous amount, and, and I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I guess, I, I think some people are surprised by this, you know, uh, uh, they read our decisions, our opinions sometimes, and, and uh, often our opinions are pretty vehement, and uh, 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 you know it seems as though we're throwing things at each other, and you think, my gosh, these people must hate each other. And in fact, at times, the Supreme Court has not been a bunch of happy campers. So there have been periods of the Supreme Court's history where there were real animosities uh, uh, in, during, uh, uh, in, in, in the court. Um, uh, the, the president was naming Kentuckians, and I was thinking I didn't know all those that people were Kentuckians, but one of the, uh, the two people that really didn't get along uh, were um, uh, Justice Brandeis and Justice, uh, 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 oh, now I'm not, McReynolds. Uh -huh. And Justice McReynolds, um, you know, kind of couldn't stand each other. And um, <laughs> Actually, it was worse than that, I will say. So Justice Brandeis was the first Jew on the court, and Justice McReynolds was a notorious anti-Semite. And Justice Brandeis would start speaking at conference. So it's so funny that these are fellow Kentuckians. Justice Brandeis, <laughs> <laughs> Justice Brandeis would start speaking at conference, and, and Justice McReynolds would literally turn his chair around so that his back was to Justice Brandeis, you know, wow. which was not very welcoming or hospitable, right? <laughs> but that's not true of our court. <laughs> we, uh, no, we really do like each other, although we, we often disagree, and we often disagree sharply, and in our opinions make that clear. Um, but I think we have a lot of respect for the, uh, I think, uh, for, for, for each other, and, 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 and think that I know that I think all my colleagues are approaching everything in good faith, and I think that they probably think the same. And uh, you know, do we uh, do we do we pal around together? Uh, you know, some of us more than others. Uh, uh, you know, uh, some of us uh, talk with each other about the work. You know, uh, you, you, know they're, they're, you know, as in any institution, some people sort of schmooze and some people don't. So some people are hall walkers and they walk into your office and talk to you and other people maybe you don't see except on more formal occasions. And then uh, for, for outside activities, again, I think it, it varies person to person. I, uh, uh, I, I go to the opera with Justice Ginsburg sometimes, and I go hunting with Justice Scalia. Let's talk about hunting for a second. Uh -huh. um, my, uh, my, a friend of mine has invited me and my boys to go duck hunting. Tell me, is that a good experience? Because your first time was with <laughs> Justice Scalia, is that correct? Well, I'll tell you. So Justice Scalia <laughs> asked me to go duck hunting this year, and I can't this year. 
But uh, he said, this is my favorite kind of hunting, is duck hunting. And I've never, I've never gone duck hunting, right. but, I, I, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> but I'm not going to be able to go this year. But Justice Scalia, has, we, we shoot birds together. We shoot okay. quail and pheasant. And, and Justice Scalia and I went out to Wyoming to shoot antelope uh, last, last year. And this is, I have to tell you, entirely new to me, because as you said, I grew up in New York City, yeah. and shooting antelope was not the pastime of, <laughs> of, not the pastime of choice there, you know, it's not what you did on a weekend. And, um, uh, but but uh, the way it got started was that when you go through the Senate confirmation process now, there's enormous emphasis on what you think about the Second Amendment and what, uh, and, and, and so as I went from office to office to office and talked to, senator, to, to senators, I kept on getting asked about um, the Second Amendment. And because you, you can't really say very much about cases or how you're going to decide cases, people find different ways to ask you things. And I kept on, so, so they kept on sort of saying, well, have you ever hunted? Well, you know, do you know anybody who hunts? Uh, you know, have you ever owned a gun? Have you ever shot a gun? Have you ever, like, picked up a gun? And I have to say that my answers to all these questions were like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it was all very, it was, these were not the answers that were really very good. And, um, uh, and uh, I was talking to a senator from Idaho, and he was telling me about uh, hunting and how important it was to him and to his constituents. And I, I was feeling a little punchy at the time, and I said, you know, Senator Rich, I, I, you know, if you invite me hunting, I would love to come. And this look of total horror, you know. <laughs> it's like, do I now have to invite this woman hunting? <laughs> and uh, so, I, 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 so I said, yeah, uh, uh, d no, you don't have to invite me hunting, but I'll tell you what, um, uh, if I'm lucky enough to be confirmed, I will ask Justice Scalia, I promise, to ask Justice Scalia, who was an avid hunter, to take me hunting. And, uh, and so when I got on the court, I went to Justice Scalia, and I told him this whole story, and I said, Nino, I said, this is the single promise I made <laughs> after having, you know, I visited 82 senators' offices. This was the only promise I made. And he thought it was hilarious. Yeah. And, uh, and he's kind of a proselytizer for hunting, you know. He would like everybody to love hunting as much as he does, you know. So, uh, so he said, good, excellent. So we started by sh shooting clay pigeons, and then we went on to quail and pheasant and such things. And antelope. And then, we, then he said, time for the big game, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I sort of, I've, I've enjoyed it. And I've, en I've enjoyed uh, spending time with him. He's a great guy. Well, um, I, I have two more questions, and then we're going to ask Mr. Riker uh, to share with us the student questions. Now, serving as the first female dean of Harvard Law School, the first female solicitor general of the United States, and now serving on the Supreme Court during the first time when this court has ever had three female justices at the same time, it puts you kind of in the vanguard of women serving in high places in the legal world. Do you think having women serve in these roles changes the nature of the legal world in, in meaningful ways? You know, I honestly don't think it, uh, it makes much of a difference inside the conference room when we talk about a case, when we decide a case. Um, but, uh, but, but that said, I think it's important anyway, because I think it's important that the institution uh, look, uh, uh, you know, sh show that uh, women are a vital part of this profession and a vital part of this society. And often I sit there and I look out into the audience. There are a lot of school groups that come in. And I think, you know, it's great that all these girls and all these boys uh, see women up here functioning in the exact same way as the men. And, uh, you know, none of the three of us, uh, Justice Sotomayor and me and Justice Ginsburg, none of the three of us are shrinking violets, you know. so. <laughs> I think our public presence is pretty strong. You can hear our voices when mm -hmm. you come into the courtroom. And I think that that, uh, that says something uh, really meaningful about the institution and the role of women in the profession and the role of women in our country. OK, well, great. Last question. You've been a part of the court doing some important and arguably controversial recent decisions, including decisions regarding the, the Affordable Care Act, DOMA, and the Voting Rights Act. Can you talk about what role you think the court should play in relation to Congress in making decisions about these kinds of controversial issues? 
Well, I, th I think, you know, it, it really, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a case by case thing. I think, uh, uh, you know, we live in a constitutional democracy and that, and the two parts of that phrase sometimes point in different directions, right? Democracy, uh, meaning that the people should decide and that the court should defer to various kinds of congressional judgments, um, but a constitutional democracy, which is to say that the, the outcomes and the decisions that the legislators and the president uh, make are subject to constitutional restraint and that the court in the end is the arbiter of where, uh, of where the political process has overrun the constitution improperly. And trying to figure out what those lines are and where to defer and where not to defer is the hardest part of yeah. being a judge. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, to, to give you a fuller answer to that question would you know, involve you in lots of you know, uh, highfalutin constitutional theory. And I'm not sure I have, I'm not sure anybody has a complete answer okay. to, to that question. But that's, those, those, are the, those are the most difficult judgments there are, is uh, figuring out um, uh, you know, where to defer to the judgments of the elected representatives of the people of this country and, uh, and where to say, no, this time you just went too far. Okay, well, great. Um, that concludes my questioning for this evening. I would like to now turn attention to the president of our law, student, uh, law school student bar association, Mr. Thomas Riker. Uh, Mr. Riker is a third-year law student, and he has some questions from the student body for you. First, I just want to say what an honor it is to get to do this. Uh, like you, I came to law school sort of looking for a life path, and I'd never expected that path to end right here. So, <laughs> it's, well, yeah, there's mu much more to come, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> but this will undoubtedly be, you know, one of the top pictures on my power wall, so I appreciate that. Um, you know, I wanted to start by asking a question that I think um, speaks to the, the you know, hardworking, beleaguered law student. Um, you were a senior editor uh, on the Harvard Law Review, and uh, as you may know, UK has two uh, student-led law journals. And so the student body was just kind of wondering if you could talk about the impact that uh, law journals and peer-reviewed academia has on the court's decision-making process. Okay. Um, well, I guess the first thing to say is I don't think that that's why people should do law review. You know, like even if I said it has no impact at all on our decision-making process, I would say, but you should still do law review. And, 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 and that's because law journal work, like many other kinds of work in, in a law school, it's not the only place that, but you know, it, uh, it's, 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 it's of great educational value and it really sharpens your skills. And not just if you want to be an academic, but for all kinds of lawyerly work. That what, what, and so I think of law reviews as, you know, in very significant part, uh, you know, uh, just great educational devices, regardless whether, uh, whether they have great impact on judicial decision making. But, you know, do, uh, do, I, I think uh, some artic articles uh, do have an impact on judicial decision making. Now, we're not the only audience for lots of uh, law review writers, right? Some law review writers might be speaking to practicing lawyers. Uh, some writers might be speaking to members of Congress. Uh, some writers might be speaking to more specialized kinds of judges. Um, uh, and then some lawyers are speaking to us, to the Supreme Court. And, uh, and, uh, and we're made aware of that, certainly. I mean, uh, uh, brief writers will cite law review articles frequently, and sometimes you'll see justices citing law review articles in their opinions. And that's, I guess, uh, the time when you know you've, you've had an impact and made a difference. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, that sometimes happens. Thank you. Uh, and then also, I was wondering if you could talk about, uh, you know, you've been at uh, the pinnacle of academia, uh, of the executive branch, of the judicial branch. Are there any um, particularly professional, but even personal goals uh, on the horizon that you think, uh, man, I'd still really like to do that? Well, you know, this is a lifetime job. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's the question then, is do you see it really truly as a lifetime gig? Uh, I, I see it really truly as a lifetime gig. 
uh, uh, but it's a great question, actually, because uh, you know it's a little bit scary. I, I uh, actually thinking about that. I got into the court. I was 50 years old. You know, I, I, I like to think I have a few good years left. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and I've had a career up until now. I talked before about doing a lot of different kinds of things and working in the private sector and going into government and going into academia. You know, to be completely frank, I had uh, the, the longest I ever spent on a job on, uh, was six years. And that was, that was the time I spent as dean. And, uh, and, and so when I got on the court, I thought, well, I better like this, you know? <laughs> Because uh, this is kind of it, and um, and and you know it seemed a lot longer than you know you hoped. It's a lot longer than six years, and uh, uh, so I'm glad to report that I do like it. You know, <laughs> and uh, it's 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 a good gig, and I would be very happy uh, making whatever contribution I can make uh, for the rest of my time. Uh, and then obviously you're an inspiration to, you know, tons of people here, but also across the nation. And uh, so we were just wondering if you could talk about some of the people that have been inspirations to you or role models you've had in your own life who have shaped the person that you've become. Oh, gosh. Like, you know, honestly, too, too many to count. I've, I've felt blessed and lucky, uh, the, the people that I've run into along the way. I mean, my, my parents, most of all, made me the, the uh, you know, the, the, the person I am. And... And the, the only thing sort of sad about the day that, uh, that, that I became a Supreme Court Justice was that my parents weren't there to see me. And I think that they would have, they would have been kind of, they, uh, I think that they would have enjoyed the day. And that was, uh, it was, it was good to think about that, but also sad to think about that. But they were uh, um, amazing role models to me in, in different ways. Uh, you know, I clerked for incredible judges, and I, I, I think about that a lot uh, when I relate to my own clerks. And, you know, I, I doubt that I can be the mentor to uh, my own clerks that, that my justices were to me, but, uh, but I clerked for some you know, incredible people who had incredible life experiences and, and, um, and did a very good job of sharing those experiences with their clerks. and, and uh, in, in ways that I think made their clerks different people as a result of, of, uh, of those years. Um, and, uh, you know, I had, great, I had great law school professors, and, uh, and, you know, every place I've been, I guess I've, I've, uh, I've, I've been really lucky that there have been people who have, who have looked out for me along the way. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I think most people don't do the things that they want to do, don't get to the places they want to get without a ton of people helping them out. And uh, I've been really fortunate in that regard. Thank you. And then uh, my final question is you talked about um, how really your, your best preparation for the court was the time you spent as Solicitor General immediately, immediately preceding your time on the court. And I just wondered if you could talk about um, anything that you found, any aspect of joining the court that you found particularly surprising after having studied it uh, so intensely for the years leading up to your appointment? You know, in a way, I think what I found surprising was that so little was surprising. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I mean that to say what's surprising is that, um, is that the court really seemed to run in the same kind of way uh, as, as when I had clerked there 25 years earlier. First, I thought that was really odd, uh, you know, uh, that all, all, just all the ways of doing business were the same. And to the even, you know, there's been a technological revolution in those 25 years. People communicate with each other differently. Well, not at the court, you know. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I did kind of say, well, what? They, 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 they haven't learned email yet, you know? And, um, uh, but, uh, you know, it, in fact, maybe this is just, you know, institutions co-opt you or something, but I think that there's a real value in, uh, you know, the, uh, the court works and works as an institution and, uh, and, and uh, you know, there's a, the, the, it's, it's a pretty conservative place in terms of changing the way it does business and I think that that's probably to the good. And uh, so I guess what, what struck me was how little the court had changed in the 25 years that I had been away from it. Uh, and, uh, but, but, but notwithstanding that, how well it worked. 
Well, thank you so much for taking time to answer our questions. Thank and you, for, Mr. Riker. Thank you. <laughs> now, the, I hope my mic is still on. Yes. Uh, the justice has graciously agreed to respond to uh, an audience question. So if, if there's anyone in the audience that would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. And Mr. Riker, if you can take the mic to whoever raises their hand, I'd appreciate it. I, it's hard for me to see with the lights. There's one here in the center. All right, so I am actually an undergraduate student. I'm a freshman here at UK, so I just now joined. So I hope you're enjoying the campus as much as I am. Um, I, I'm in computer engineering, so that's sort of my personality, and I, I, I tend to think big picture and towards the future. And obviously, since you are new at the court, you know, you are the, the freshman of the court, per se, um, I, was, I was curious to see with recent past or acts like SOPA and various things like that, how you see that we're becoming more of a globalized um, society and how you view the realm of law and maybe it would change or evolve or adapt to the globalization of society in general. Wow, that's really big for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, do, do you, since you are a freshman, like at, from, from my perspective, I, I enjoy looking towards the future and maybe, you know, it, <laughs> and, and envisioning things. So I wanted to know if maybe you, you had some sort of vision or... or, or um. Uh, well, I, I have no idea if this is the question you asked. But this is <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but the, I'm, but I'm an engineer. The question I'm going to answer yeah. is this, all right? Uh, I actually think that the, that the uh, if, you, if you look ahead, if you, if you said to me, you know, what is the court really going to have to grapple with in the next 5, 10, 15 years? Uh, that there are going to be huge questions on the horizon uh, that come from... Uh, you know, you, you said globalization. I mean, I actually think that that is less important than you said you were a computer scientist than, than new technologies. And I think in all kinds of ways, um, uh, the speed with which technological developments are taking place is going to make a lot of legal questions uh, look different. And that that's an, a, a real challenge for the court. And, and it's, it's an especial challenge because of what I said before. I think we're all aware of this, is that uh, you know, we're all people of a certain age. We're not necessarily all the most well-versed in the ways the technology is shaping and reshaping society around, societies around the world. I think, to, I think just recently there was a case involving whether if you like someone on Facebook, is that protected speech? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, my colleagues are like, what's Facebook? You know? <laughs> no, we're, we're, we're not that bad. We're not that bad. Uh, uh, no, but I think it's, 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 it's a real challenge to, you know, to learn enough about all these newfangled things that one didn't grow up with oneself, right? Uh, to be able to make good and wise decisions and to, you know, to, to help in the way that a court ought to help uh, the society respond to the new questions that are going to arise from new technologies. Okay, well, great. Well, I want to thank you, um, Justice Kagan, for uh, this insightful discussion. The law school community, the students, the alumni, faculty, administrators, and staff want to show you their appreciation. I think we have a, a, a little physical representation of that appreciation. I'm going to ask two of our professors who are graduates of Harvard Law School, Roberta Harding and Jennifer Bird Poland, to present to you a gift from the entire law school community. Why did you invite me when basketball season was going on? Come back. <laughs> We have a bunch of Kentucky goodies for you. Uh, I don't know what they all are, but they look pretty good. It all looks very fattening. Yes. No basketball. No, we, have, we have coffee and <laughs> coffee in there too. There's a book and all kinds of good things. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And, and, and I want to add that both Professor Harding and Professor Burke Poland were very instrumental in getting Justice Kagan here. Um, I remember going into their office and said, okay, you guys sent her a personal note inviting her to come <laughs> along with my official letter, and they did that, and we are so thankful that you responded favorably. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Brennan. Thank you.